<clears throat> okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as you know, um, we are in the most advanced part of this course where we are uh, now um, focusing on um, research papers. So we are uh, we have already started last week where we uh, have spent um, some time looking at the soft actor critic paper and uh, we also uh, looked at some uh, details of the implementation that you can find on uh, spinning up uh, which is um, this uh, open source code where you find um, several state-of-the-art algorithms uh, for reinforcement learning implemented both uh, in PyTorch and TensorFlow. Uh, so this week we are continuing uh, this kind of activity, uh, but we'll be focused on a, a new algorithm, which is uh, PPO, um, Proximal Policy Optimiz Optimization. And you um, already heard about this uh, last week somehow because uh, this was one of the baselines that Soft Actor Critic was comparing with. So, uh, if you remember, Soft Actor Critic was uh, actually is an off policy uh, reinforcement learning algorithm where they use uh, this uh, entropy bonus um, to modify the uh, optimization objective for the reinforcement learning problem. Um, PPO, Proximal Policy Optimization, instead is a non-policy algorithm. Right? So uh, this means that data uh, that come from the past or from different versions of the policy, so from a different behavior policy compared to the one that we are learning about, um, cannot be uh, reused. So in this kind of algorithm, we only reuse we only use uh, data that come from uh, a version of the policy which is the same uh, or not so different uh, from the one that we are learning about. So let me zoom in a bit. Um, as last time, I have highlighted in the paper the parts that we're uh, going to focus on, and I have some extra material over here that we're going to look at. And uh, again, this will be also one of the uh, algorithms that you will be uh, uh, implementing or using uh, according to the type of project that you will choose uh, for the final um, uh, project for this course. Uh, alongside other own policy algorithms, including uh, TRPO, which uh, is anyway explained um, uh, at a high level in this paper. Okay, so um, as usual, starting from the abstract, we get the overall idea and then we go to the introduction. We'll see more uh, precisely what the contributions of the paper are. And finally, we go to the um, actual approach and experimental sections. So um, the, as you can read here, policy graded method for reinforcement learning, um, which typically alternate between sampling data uh, through interaction, as we have seen in our course with the environment, and optimizing, uh, in general, some um, value function of uh, or um, policy. Are, I mean, uh, we, we have seen this, uh, are um, very successful for several uh, reasons. Um, and can be optimized, these functions can be optimized using uh, stochastic gradient ascent. Right, right, where the objective function represents uh, is represented by a performance function which typically coincides with some version of uh, the uh, value function or uh, the return, uh, because in the expectation the return coincides with the value function. Um, so in this paper, they propose a surrogate objective function, which, which means it's a slightly different uh, objective function compared to the one that we are used uh, to. And compared to standard policy gradient methods in this paper, they propose uh, an approach that allows uh, to 
um, perform several updates using the same uh, data compared to standard policy gradient methods where you can just perform one gradient uh, update for every trajectory that you have because you cannot reuse uh, your data. In this case, they, um, uh, they allow you to reuse uh, the data coming from the same uh, trajectory um, as long as the idea is as long as the policy doesn't move too much from the one that originated the data. Okay, so this is why it's it's no policy method. Um, so why do they propose uh, such an approach? Um, the reasons are pretty similar to the ones that we have seen for SAC. So uh, the men, the authors mention here that Q learning with function approximator uh, can fail on many simple problems. Um, uh, also because it has not been demonstrated to perform well on continuous control uh, benchmarks um, and it's poorly understood with function approximation, not, uh, not in the tabular case. Also vanilla policy gradient methods have uh, poor data efficiency, meaning that they require a lot of data and robustness, meaning that they um, the uh, basin of hyperparameters that um, allow us to uh, converge to a solution is not uh, very large, which is uh, uh, problematic in order to uh, find uh, a, a way to have our algorithm converging. Um, beyond this, there are other, other methods like Trust region policy optimization (TRPO), uh, which are um, more complicated and they are uh, not compatible also with some specific architectures for neural networks that include noise, for example, dropout layers, um, or parameter sharing between the policy and the value, fun value function. So, what does it mean, parameter sharing between the policy and value function? It means that in the end, you can have one single big network where you have uh, two separate heads, one representing the value function and the other one representing the policy. So they share the weights or at least um, two or three layers. And then maybe each uh, of these objects has uh, its own additional uh, fully connected layer, one or two or something like that. Um, so uh, with this paper, the authors try to uh, improve uh, on these problems by introducing an algorithm, an algorithm that um, uh, preserves the data efficiency and the uh, kind of perform performance that TRPO is capable of achieving while uh, using, however, a simplified uh, optimization because, for example, trust region uh, policy optimization, TRPO, is complicated because the optimization requ requires um, second order optimization methods um, like uh, the conjugate gradient method. Um, okay, so uh, they mentioned here that to optimize the policies, uh, we alternate between sampling data from the policy and performing several, of a, several epochs of optimization on the sample data. So this is the uh, one of the main novelties of this approach. So the fact that you can perform several epochs of optimization using one single uh, one single or maybe reusing the same trajectory. Okay, um, the questions and uh, okay, so now we have uh, some uh, background where they explain I and mean, they give you the notion of policy gradient methods that you wish we should be familiar with. They introduce the trust region uh, methods and then they uh, move on with their uh, proposed approach. Um, okay, so we know that policy gradient methods uh, work by computing uh, directly the policy and optimizing it uh, by looking at the policy gradient um, and uh, 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 using also stochastic gradient ascent algorithm that as I was saying before, optimizes over performance function with which is typically um, uh, representing uh, some information about uh, the value function. 
um, so one common uh, gradient estimator uh, has this kind of form. So you know that uh, we have typically the gradient of the logarithm of the policy that multiplies some uh, performance um, element that we have seen this can be just the return, the return minus the baseline and so on and so forth. For example, that was the case of reinforce. Um, and uh, here, A is the advantage function. We have seen that the advantage function in, in previous classes. Uh, although there are different methods for estimating the advantage function here, they use one specific method, but there, there can be uh, many. And uh, all of this is under an expectation term, as we have seen in class, because this indicates that this is an empirical average over a finite batch of samples. Hmm? So you have some samples that you're collecting from environment and then you uh, are averaging uh, empirically uh, among these. Um, and the algorithm is as usual alternating between sampling and optimization. Um, so uh, as they mentioned here, why did this appear? So, uh, so the question is, might be actually, why are you saying that um, it's a problem, it was a problem before reusing data from the same trajectory. Uh, well, you can try to do that, uh, but you will see that um, uh, results are not uh, as good as you would like, because basically um, uh, the information that you're optimizing on do not reflect anymore the uh, policy that you're trying to optimize. So it's like the uh, target policy is um, moving too far away from the um, uh, behavior policy. So um, this means that in order to do that, you need to move to end of policy algorithm or to use an approach uh, like the one proposed in PPO. So um, they write here why it, is, why it is appealing to perform multiple steps of optimization on this kind of loss using the same trajectory. Doing so is not well justified for the reasons I was explaining uh, right now. And empirically, it often leads to um, very large policy updates. Um, so in TRPO, which is uh, um, another uh, approach that has been proposed in literature, um, Another objective function, this surrogate objective, is maximized uh, subject to uh, constraint on the sides of the policy update. Why? Because uh, if you put a constraint on the sides of the policy update, you can basically force the policy to be not, the target policy to be not as far away uh, from the behavior policy. So basically they are the same policy and you are still performing a on policy update where the uh, update the um, update that you're doing is well justified. Uh, so this is why um, in uh, TRPO they propose uh, uh, an objective function which is um, the following. So it's uh, to maximize an expectation uh, this uh, uh, ratio between uh, the new policy and uh, the version the previous version of the policy that multiplies the advantage function under the constraints that the KL divergence between the old policy and the new version of the policy is um, uh, smaller than uh, a small delta. So the KL divergence, uh, as we have seen last time, um, is something that measures the difference between two distributions. Okay, so uh, here we are saying that the distribution coming out of the new policy and uh, the one of the old policy should not be very different. Actually, their difference should be very small, smaller than this delta. Hmm? Um, now, if you want to do an optimization like this with a specific uh, constraint like this, then you need to use uh, some uh, second order method uh, like the conjugate gradient uh, algorithm. Um, also, after making some approximations, so you have to make a linear approximation to the objective function and a quadratic ap approximation to the constraint in order to use this uh, kind of approach. Uh, so in theory, instead of using uh, this constraint as a hard constraint, 
which is what you would do in the case of using a conjugate gradient algorithm. And then I'm assuming you're familiar with these algorithms because you should have done uh, uh, this in other um, optimization courses or in your bachelor degree. Uh, if not, um, I will, uh, you can let me know, I can point you to some material regarding that. Um, anyway, uh, instead of using this sort of hard constraint, you could use some soft constraint by basically um, uh, modifying your objective function in this way. So you have still the ratio that multiplies uh, the advantage function, but then you have some beta coefficient that um, multiplies uh, this um, uh, KL divergence factor, and this altogether goes to be subtracted to the original objective function. Why this is useful? Because this basically sets a lower bound for the optimization. Huh? Um, okay. So, um, however, uh, in practice, if you look at this, if you try to do this kind of optimization in this way, experiments show that this is not um, uh, very easy because it's not sufficient to choose a, a fixed uh, coefficient, beta, uh, but this should change over, um, over uh, the same training and between different um, uh, problems. And uh, so optimizing this can be very uh, difficult. This is why the authors propose uh, a different uh, surrogate objective, which is a clipped surrogate uh, objective. Um, but before moving on, let me see if there are questions. Okay, um, post them here if you have questions, of course. Okay, so what is this surrogate objective? Basically, it's almost the same, except that there is a clipping uh, when uh, the uh, new policy is moving too far away from the old policy. So if we uh, use R uh, to dem denote this uh, ratio between the uh, new policy and the old policy, right? Then we know that the ratio of the uh, old policy divided by the old policy will be one, okay? So this is uh, easy. So TRPO is using this target objective, which is the one that we have this thing before, which is multiplying basically R um, and um, the advantage function, right? Uh, now, we can slightly modify uh, uh, this, which is uh, in, in the following way. So the main objective that the authors propose is the uh, following, which is um, a stealing expectation to use the minimum between the original TRPO, uh, uh, the original TRPO um, objective function and a version where this ratio uh, is clipped uh, around one. So what does it mean? It's clipped to be at a distance not bigger than epsilon uh, from the old policy, right? Because the uh, this R here would be at one when the policy is uh, the new, when the new policy corresponds exactly to the old policy, right? So if we clip it around one minus epsilon and one plus epsilon, where uh, in a sphere around um, uh, this uh, situation where this uh, um, policy, this new policy is uh, at a maximum distance of epsilon from the old policy, okay? So of course, epsilon is in a hyperparameter, so you need to tune that and understand what is the best value in, in their experiments, they say epsilon uh, equals 0 0.2 is the best value that they have found. So this second term, so we have two terms here. One is the original one, and the second one is uh, uh, the new ones where they're just clipping R, right? So they're just uh, adding this extra information and they're saying, if 
this is smaller, then we keep this. But if R is growing too much, then we clip it at around uh, epsilon, one minus epsilon, sorry. Um, so they're clipping the probability ratio, removing the incentive for the policy to move outside this interval, uh, which is, again, you can imagine as a sphere around the old policy. And if the new policy moves too far away from it, they're, um, they're outside this uh, uh, epsilon uh, constraint, then they are uh, um, clipping it. And uh, so they take the minimum of the clipped and the unclipped objective so that the final objective is big. Again, a uh, lower bound, so a pessimistic bound on the uh, unclipped uh, objective. Uh, why? Because if it is smaller, then uh, you don't need to clip it. If it is larger, then you have this lower bound. Mm -hmm. So um, as they mentioned here, they only ignore the change in the probability ratio when it could make the objective improve. Right, so they avoid uh, this optimistic change where they uh, uh, incentivize the policy to move too far away from the uh, old one. And again, this allows you to use um, still data coming from the same trajectory. Why? Because now your uh, policy will still be in this uh, uh, sphere around the old policy. So it will not move too far away from it during the optimization. And so you know that the uh, behavior policy basically and the target policy do not differ uh, anymore uh, beyond the self uh, epsilon uh, factor. And so you can stay on policy and you can uh, reuse uh, also your data by, by means of this clipped uh, function. Okay, so um, is, is this idea clear? Because, okay, so why we need to use the trust region, uh, which is basically what I was just repeating now. So um, if you, so if you are of policy, right, you can, you have one behavior policy and one target policy, which means that the behavior policy can be anything and the target policy can be anything, which means that as a result of this, um, if you generated your data with a version of your policy, which was, I don't know, 50 uh, updates before, it's not a problem, right? Because even if your new policy is very different from the old one, Right, your target policy is very different from the behavior policy that generated this data, it's, it's fine because you're off policy. Uh, if you are on policy, this is uh, problematic because if you move too far away from um, this trust region, then you're, you cannot trust your data anymore. <laughs> Uh, because these data do not come anymore from the uh, same policy that you're trying to uh, uh, optimize, which doesn't guarantee any uh, kind of performance in the case of on policy algorithms. Actually, it can lead to very large updates that can lead to um, uh, unstable uh, uh, performance and updates. On the contrary, you want instead your, uh, I, I will keep talking about target and behavior policy, even if we are in the own policy case, just to uh, let you understand that in the own policy case, they should be the same thing, right? But, um, but given that they are not in practice, you want the uh, target policy to be as close as possible to the behavior uh, policy. Instead, what happens if you are doing several updates using um, some data, then while updating your target policy is changing, right? So it's, it's moving away from the old policy. And if it is moving too far away from the old policy, then you cannot reuse these, um, the, the same data because you, one update using some data moved your policy away and uh, it's not possible to reuse anymore those, those 
data coming from the behavior policy because now the target and behavior policy are different. Um, uh, on the contrary, if you are in this trust region, if you don't move your target policy too far away from the behavior policy, then you can still use that data because it's still reflecting something that comes from the same probability distribution. Mm. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to explain this better or more if it is unclear. So if you uh, have more questions regarding this, please let me know. Huh? I hope I clarified this. If not, again, I can try to repeat it. Um, and I also can try to um, use some the, the whiteboard to explain you this better. Uh, if you can please comment on <clears throat> Slido if you got the idea now or not, uh, I would appreciate that. Okay. Okay, so... <clears throat> um, PPO, uh, so the main... Uh, proposal of BPO is this clipped surrogate objective. They also have uh, an alternative proposal, which is an approach where they have these, um, they use the KL um, divergence penalty, but with an adaptive uh, uh, coefficient. Okay, so uh, we're not going to focus too much on this because uh, in this uh, you will see also in the experiments uh, they found that the KL penalty performs worse than the clip surrogate objective uh, which is why basically in most cases they use uh, uh, just the clipped uh, surrogate objective function so uh, let's look at the overall algorithm um, uh, which is uh, over here so uh, PPO, you, uh, I mean, for several iterations, you can have several actors, um, several actors running the same uh, policy. So these actors can run in parallel, can execute the policy uh, in uh, an environment for uh, a certain amount of time steps where T is um, smaller than the, um, uh, episode length uh, and then they can compute the advantages <clears throat> and after uh, doing all of this they can optimize the surrogate loss with a certain number of epochs uh, and mini batch sizes okay and after that the uh, old policy gets replaced by the new policy <clears throat> now how can you compute uh, the advantage in there are several ways to do this uh, some we have seen in class, there is another way of doing this, however, um, but most techniques in any case uh, use, uh, in order to compute a variance reduced advantage function, make use of a learned state value function, V. So um, uh, another approach uh, that makes use of this is uh, the following. So one style of policy gradient implementation, which is popularized um, by this paper, uh, and well used also with, for use with recurrent neural networks, runs the policy for uh, t time steps. Mm -hmm. So where t is less much, uh, sorry, is much less than the episode length, and uses the collected samples for an update. So mm, this update is done by using uh, this um, kind of estimation. So uh, they are um, using the corrected estimate being the sum of the rewards discounted until the uh, last uh, step um, number T. And then uh, they are uh, adding also um, the uh, discounted value function at state uh, T. And this uh, is used then to compute the error uh, by making the difference uh, also with the value function uh, at, the, at the first state, as the uh, small t, okay? So I don't know if, if this is clear. Again, here, the, this is the uh, new 
is the correction of our estimate and this is the old estimate, okay? So this is how uh, the advantage is being computed. So why is this uh, a good advantage estimation? We say that the advantage is giving us some information regarding uh, uh, how uh, good some uh, actions are compared to the other ones by uh, removing some, uh, I mean, for example, in the um, uh, case that we have seen in when, when looking at reinforce, we say the advantage can be uh, computed by removing the value function uh, from the uh, return y because uh, the value function represents uh, for us the mean value of uh, a certain state. Here we're doing the same thing, right? Because we're here we're computing a truncated uh, return and this truncation occurs at state uh, number t. And uh, when, when we do the truncation, we multiply, um, we use bootstrapping to rely on the, uh, our uh, estimate of the value function at that uh, state and still we remove uh, the uh, value function over here. So the, there is nothing different, right? Uh, different. It's still um, similar, it's just slightly different in the way uh, this element is computed. Um, so uh, again, this is not specific to this argument, however, you can use different kind uh, of advantage estimators, the ones that you think are best suited for your problem. Uh, the important thing is that you compute these advantages and then you optimize the surrogate loss the way we have uh, seen. Um, okay. Um, so the experiments of this paper are the following. They compare, uh, they, they, they perform several comparisons. Um, the first comparison that they perform is between different versions of these um, surrogate objectives. So the one uh, without um, clipping or penalty, which is basically the TRPO uh, objective, uh, the clipping one and the KL uh, penalty one. Um, Okay, so the authors say, because we're searching over parameters for each uh, algorithm variant, we choose uh, the computational chip benchmark to test the algorithms on. Uh, namely, we use seven simulated robotics uh, tasks implemented in OpenAI Gym, which use the Mujoko physics, en physics engine. Uh, we do 1 million um, uh, time steps of training on each one, and besides the hyperparameter used for clipping and the KL uh, penalty, which we search over, the other hyperparameters are provided in table three. So there is a table at the end of the paper where there are the other, all the other hyperparameters. Um, so um, let's go on OpenAI Jim. Um, somebody muted, seems like. Okay. So if we go on OpenAI Jim and we click on environments, and you click on Mujoko, you will see that there are um, a bunch of environments here, uh, and these are the ones that they use. So, um, for example, Ant, Archita, Hopper, Humanoid are the ones that have been used um, in order to do this kind of training. So, those are the ones that they are referring to. Mm. Um, okay, uh, which kind of policy they used? So they used a policy that was represented as a um, uh, fully connected multi-layer perception with two uh, hidden layers of 64 units and uh, tan h nonlinearities uh, outputting, as we have seen for, um, that is common for uh, continuous control problems, outputting the mean of a Gaussian distribution with variable standard deviation. Okay, so we have seen this already, so we will not focus on this unless you have questions regarding it. Each algorithm was run on all seven environments with three random seeds on each. Again, why we have seen this already last time, why do you want to have different random seeds? Because one random, the random seed controls uh, basically the random numbers that are being 
uh, sampled by your computer, but and you want to make sure, that, first of all, that by using the same random seed, you can reproduce your results, and by changing random seeds, you can uh, keep under control the fact that basically you you are you have not been lucky by selecting as a, a, a lucky seed that was uh, actually helping your uh, results. Um, so they scored each run on, of the algorithm by computing the average total reward of the last 100 uh, episodes. And as you can see here, they run it with different other parameters um, and uh, they um, achieve the um, best performance by using the clipping uh, with uh, 0.2 uh, epsilon. Um, so this means that the policy can, the new policy can move uh, from the old one uh, at most of this uh, uh, distance in the policy space. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So uh, beyond comparing between different uh, surrogate objective, objective functions, of course, they also compare to uh, other algorithms, um, which include uh, Trust region policy optimization, of course, given that that was their reference. Um, cross entropy method and vanilla policy gradient with adaptive step size, and also A to C, uh, and uh, which is um, uh, advantage actor query, which is an algorithm uh, that is a, uh, that uh, is used uh, and it's on the policy version uh, still uh, of. Uh, actor critic that is uh, now at the state of the art. Uh, you will also find other algorithms that are uh, uh, named in a similar way. Uh, specifically, A3C is just A3C is an asynchronous version of A2C, where uh, um, A2C is, is instead synchronous. So here there is no comparison with SAC, of course, because soft actor, actor critic comes after. So. The, um, at this time, soft actor, actor feed did not exist um, at all. So, uh, as you mentioned, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the um, environments in which they run their experiments are the ones that you have seen here. So, Alf Cheetah, Hopper, oops, okay, uh, Alf Cheetah, where this sort of animal has to try to walk, Hopper. Uh, is this um, object over here that has to learn to jump and move forward and all the ones that you can find here. Inverted double pendulum, inverted pendulum, richer swimmer, walker to the. Um, then to showcase the performance of PPO on high dimensional continuous control problems, we train on a set of problems involving a 3D humanoid where the robot must run, steer and get up off the ground possibly while uh, being pelted by uh, cubes. So, and for this, uh, we have uh, this material over here that we can look at. So this is one of the environments that we, they used. So, uh, so as you see this, uh, uh, humanoid is trying to is learning or has learned to uh, walk and run while being hit uh, by uh, this. I think it's it's a ball or whatever it is, uh, or no, it's a cube. Yes, it's the white uh, small cube. Yes, <laughs> um, that uh, of course is an obstacle for him to uh, continue working, and this is the result that they. Um, get. Um, here they're explaining the algorithm. There is also another video. Um, agents trained with uh, PPO develop a flexible movement policy that let them improvise uh, turns and tilts as they head towards a target uh, location. I think it's interesting to look at all of these because so there is also another um, uh, 
baseline here, another, uh, sorry, um, experiment that they run. So they use PPO to teach complicated simulated, simulated robots to work like the Atlas uh, robot uh, from Boston Dynamics. Uh, this robot has uh, 30 distinct joints. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, this simulated robot learns to work uh, very well. So if I'm not mistaken, uh, now I'm not entirely sure about that. I should verify, verify this statement, but if I'm not mistaken for the hide and seek uh, paper, they used uh, PPO as well. Uh, let me double check. Yes, agent, agent policies are trained with self-play and proximal policy optimization. So, I mean, you have seen this video uh, already, but we can look at this again, right? So this is where the agents <clears throat> learn to play hide and seek. Right, so they used to learn uh, to they learn to use the ramps uh, to uh, jump, and they also learn to exploit simulator bugs uh, in order to uh, to escape or, or to find to find their um, the opponents. Okay. Uh, wait. Okay. Close this. So this is a very advanced algorithm, as you can see, because uh, it's being used to obtain very interesting results at the state of the art. Huh? So um, again, if the if you understand this uh, kind of uh, stuff that we're talking about, then you are uh, at very I mean at a very good level of understanding of the reinforcement learning problem and uh, in general of the approaches that can be um, uh, used. Uh, okay, so uh, here there is uh, some other material that um, I wanted to share with you. So we're not looking at this here now, but if you want to understand better the paper, there is uh, some uh, extra material on the Spinning Up website where they explain uh, the uh, algorithm uh, itself. And uh, they explain even more in detail the uh, idea of uh, uh, clipping. So there is also the pseudocode over here. Uh, and uh, this allows you to uh, uh, understand it better if you want. I wanted to look at the um, implementation over here, where basically there is not a lot that changes from what we have seen for the soft actor theoretic implementation. So we have two models over here. We have um, a pi and a v, so the policy and uh, the uh, uh, value function. So the value function is used in order to compute uh, the um, the returns that are the, and to optimize the advantage function uh, basically so the um, so the value loss here is a simple mean square error between the value predicted by the value function on the observation and the uh, uh, and the return uh, the truncated return uh, and um, uh, while the loss for the uh, policy is exactly the one that we have been uh, looking at. So um, the policy loss is computed by looking, first of all, uh, at the log uh, probability of the new policy on the observation and computing the ratio. 
right, where the ratio is um, the, the uh, ratio between these uh, two policies. Again, this, if you do the exponential, it's the same thing, right? Uh, so the exponential of the log p minus uh, the log p old then is the ratio that we have been looking um, before because here we are in logarithm space. So the uh, division is the same as the difference. So the logarithm of the new policy minus the logarithm of the old policy is this, uh, that division, then you use the exponential and you bring it away from the logarithm space. Um, then you do uh, the clipping and then you compute the loss as the minimum between the ratio and the advantage function and the clipped uh, version of it. Uh, uh, here they also use some extra information for logging, but this is just for logging. There is, this is not used for optimization reasons. Huh? Okay, so here they're computing the KL divergence, the entropy just for their, some, for some debugging uh, needs. Okay, so um, uh, in the update function, in the end, what they do is they train the policy with multiple steps of gradient descent, well, which is uh, reusing the uh, uh, same data and uh, different, uh, I mean, the same batches as well, as you would do for any standard uh, uh, supervised learning training, so, uh, sort of. Okay, so you first zero the gradient, you compute the loss, and then you perform um, uh, a backward. So you, uh, you compute uh, the gradients and then you apply the gradients by using uh, this step function on the optimizer. And then um, for, uh, um, I mean, for I range train pi iterations, this means that you are doing it for several uh, iterations, as I was mentioning. Uh, same thing, uh, I mean, for the value function, there is not a lot that changes. And I mean, the return uh, here is being computed inside this main loop. Mm -hmm. As you see here, the episode return is being, is summing the rewards that are coming from the environment. And it's, uh, um, yeah, and this information also is also stored over here in this buffer, uh, which is used in order to uh, uh, sample then the data uh, that are used at training time. And of course, at the end uh, of um, an episode, when the epoch ends or the uh, the uh, state is terminal the return is uh, set to zero and the episode length uh, length uh, as well and yeah so again you can spend more time looking at this code uh, um, offline but um, i hope the overall idea is clear so let me see if there are uh, questions. Okay, so I mean, if there are no questions, again, um, for today, this is it. So you can get some extra uh, relaxing time before the next class. Um, we're, we're continuing to look at some uh, uh, material like this for the next class. And then, um, so the next class is uh, the 14th 
and the 15 will be our last class. Um, so I would try first of all to get uh, the homework results out during this week. And uh, for the 15, I would like uh, you to uh, collect all your questions, doubts or um, concerns, and we can talk about this. So I, I, I think the last uh, new material that we'll talk about will be uh, next Monday and then on uh, Tuesday we'll just focus on um, clarifying points and doubts if there are um, actually uh, please I mean I, I will open um, I will open a slide of uh, for that uh, day so that you can ask uh, questions um, I will do that right after this class Okay, so I see there are no questions, then we can close it here for today. And uh, I mean, thanks for your time. <laughs>